Well, it's great to be here, John. Thank you very much. Um, Five years ago, I would not have expected to find myself talking about food and agriculture. I've devoted most of my professional life to other things, to energy, particularly renewables. But my, my, my wife became absolutely fixated on the 800 different breeds of cows. Uh, like some Audubon Society people keep life lists of birds, she actually developed a life list of cows. And uh, we got more and more intrigued by them and then started taking them more seriously. And we realized, for example, if you put all the cows in the United States on the one side of the scale, all the people on the other side, the cows would outweigh us by two and a half times. There are so many things that we hadn't known before we got into that that I've now started digging a little bit more deeply in the agricultural food space. Um, and I, I should also say thank you for the plug. The, the book actually will not be available until next March. It's from W.W. Norton. But you can pre-order it. <laughs> okay. Um, we, the, first of all, the triumph of, of this. Uh, we spend a, a much smaller fraction of our income on food today than ever before in human history, whether you're thinking of that as the financial income or the energy income or what have you. But one reason why this cost is so small is because we've been externalizing so much of the cost of the production on the environment. Our food system is simultaneously eroding into oblivion some of the richest topsoil in the world. It's depleting relatively rapidly the largest aquifer in the United States. It's kind of directly creating dead zones at the mouths of all of our rivers. Um, it is driving species to extinction at alarming rates, both through some of those chemicals uh, we were just discussing, but, but also just through habitat destruction, taking over the natural areas that used to support other critters and turning them over to making food. Um, and also a little bit outside the strict boundaries perhaps of this session, but, but I think should be important to all of us. We're often doing it with a level of cruelty to those animals that is simply barbaric. Um, at the same time, we're creating with that food an epidemic of obesity, of diabetes, of fatty liver disease, other things. Uh, we're converting our diets into things that are basically increasingly different types of sugars and carbohydrates. And uh, when we do get, for example, cheap protein, it's often very low quality, incredibly fatty protein. Um, and all of this is in some sense viewed by parts of society as a triumph because there is so much of it. There's enough food now being grown in the world to feed all of the people in the world relatively well if it's distributed correctly. Um, but in fact, that triumph has had all of these costs that we've been talking about. If you look back historically at how we got into this, there, I don't think there's some vast malevolent evil plot that began with the agricultural revolution. We, like all other critters, have been very interested in finding food to keep ourselves going. And um, as that has progressed in step after step after step, with consolidation of power, consolidation of ownership, uh, consolidation of all of the means of production, it's, it's produced as an almost natural organic outgrowth, these things we were talking about. I mean, back 2,000 years ago, there were critters called orcs. They were fierce, they were mean, they were smart, they were very clever. Uh, orcs used to fight gladiators in the Roman Colosseum. Orcs were the progenitors of all of the cows in the world. I've often wondered who was the brave person who first chose to try and milk an oryx. So it's a, a very high risk proposition. Julius Caesar used to be terrified of his men encountering wild oryx out there. Needless to say, there are few people that are that terrified about encountering a dairy cow. We have taken the oryx and we've bred them into all of these things designed to maximize the production of, of milk and, um, and of beef. As part of that entire process, um, we have had a bunch of unfortunate things that have come with it. Uh, as ownership is consolidated, it's moved away from that sense of place that is obviously all of the speakers have spoken about is very important. Not only designing buildings with a sense of place in mind, but, but stewarding your land with a sense of what are the unique opportunities and qualities of that land. It's come with a barbaric indifference sometimes to other sentient beings. Interesting, humans, as far as I know, are the only 
animals on Earth that empathize with some of their food. And I, and I think that that is a desirable evolutionary thing that we are paying attention to other critters besides ourselves. Um, and Dennis, unfortunately, Dennis, as you move further and further Dennis, away, excuse me, could you try to move your mic a little closer to your mouth? I think it might might give us a clearer uh, sound. Okay. Thanks, David. Is this better? I think it is, yes. A little bit? Okay. Don't do anything more. Good. And I will project a little more, too, that we're in an open office space. We've got people all around me who are listening to this at the same time your audience is. Um, uh, let me see where I was here. I, I guess the family farm has been destroyed by a series of explicit federal policies. They were all launched by Earl Butts back in the Nixon administration. The laws have continued to evolve. Power has flown into smaller and smaller numbers of hands, both in the manufacturers of pesticides and seeds, uh, in the control of farmland, in the processing of farm animals. And as this has happened, um, uh, all of the things that I've already been talking about have sort of flown out as a natural consequence. The good news at the end of all of this is that this is all within potentially our control. There are so many things that we can't control without moving into politics and public policy, both of which are now somewhat, you know, in fact, pretty highly corrupted, and has led to some of these uh, log jams, particularly at the national level, but increasingly even at lower levels of government as well. But food, uh, by creating demands for things among ourselves as, as enlightened consumers, uh, this is something that, unlike war or income inequality or health care, we can decide what it is that we're going to buy and the market will ultimately respond. If we demand that things come from stuff that is organic, that is locally produced, that is, in the case of animals, not animals that are confined feeding operations and kept inside cages but allowed to roam free and are processed well, uh, we can create something that will cause, I believe, the entire food agricultural system that we've developed over time to unwind and turn into something that will still produce as much food as everyone needs, but a far higher quality food. So say there's, wrapping up here since we had this injunction to stay within time, this, this is sort of important. If you move into the kind of system that I'm talking about, you are not going to have as much beef as you will if you've got 93 million cows. We simply shouldn't be. The proper number even for a society has decided that it was going to be relying upon beef as a staple is probably closer to 25 or 30 million lean, grass-fed, grass-finished, organically produced, humanely processed critters. Uh, but there's no reason that we should be having five big Macs a day. We should be having lean and meat. And that's the sort of thing that, in fact, by demanding it, we actually can get. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic that if we can create, in effect, a social movement where people think of eating not just as an act of nutrition, but as a political act, and one that has moral consequences in their choices, uh, we can genuinely begin to turn around this very major sector of the American economy. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis. That's great. It reminds me of a phrase of the slow food movement, which is voting with your fork. Okay. 